third button here. So what to observe? Uh, these are about you know what kinds of things might be up in the sky. Uh, of course, today is a terrible rainy day, and you know we have far too many of those here in the southeast. Uh, but uh, Jared uh, Cassidy, our planetarium director is going to kick this off and talk about uh, what's up in the October sky in the planetarium. So I'll turn it over to you, Jared. All right, thanks, Eric. Uh, let me uh, see if, we can, if I can share my screen. Uh, let's see, I wanna go to screen two. And let's see that. Can you guys see that? Hello? No, it cannot, Jared. Okay, stand by. Let's try it again. Does uh, Jared have the screen share option? Oh, there we go. There we go. We got it. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, welcome to our virtual astronomy day event. Um, I'm Jared Cassidy, the Planetarium Director here at the Von Braun Astronomical Society, and we'll take you on a quick tour of the Werner Von Braun Planetarium, as well as a brief journey through the current night sky. We will look at some of the prominent constellations that are visible this time of the year, as well as where to find some of our solar system neighbors. Now, as you can tell from my background, I'm here at the Planetarium. Actually, no, I'm not, but uh, does kind of look like I am. Uh, actually at our planetarium, it probably kind of looks something like this, um, probably even foggier than, than this picture shows. But uh, the Werner von Braun Planetarium at, uh, at VBAS was opened in 19, November of 1967. Uh, took a lot of effort to, to put it together. Uh, 60 volunteers working 2,200 hours. So uh, it was a lot, of, a lot of effort at the time. And as you can see, uh, when you do come to visit, when we're open back from uh, the COVID event, the entrance to the planetarium is here next to these steps. Uh, there's a sign that says planetarium. And you just go through the set of doors that's inside this uh, vestibule here. So this is the star of our show. This is the Spitz A3 projector. It's an electro or electromechanical uh, type optical star projector. Uh, it was sold mostly to colleges and uh, schools in the 1960s and 1970s. Now we actually got this projector in the summer of 2011 from uh, a school in Walker County, Georgia. You'll also notice uh, this, there's a skyline here. That's what this cutout is here. It goes all the way around the planetarium, the base of the planetarium dome. And that was produced by Wilhelm Angla. Uh, and it represents the mountains and hills that uh, encircle downtown Huntsville. The most prominent, of course, is uh, the ridge here on the east wall. This is directly opposite the, the entrance door. And this is Montesano. And, uh, VBAS is located here at the northeast side of the mountain. So the um, star projector projects uh, about 1,500 stars uh, using pinholes and uh, lenses to project uh, the brighter stars. And it was designed for a dome of 24 to 40 feet. Now our dome is 33 feet. And this is the star ball. This is actually what uh, creates the stars that people would see on the dome of our projector or on the dome itself. Uh, these little, little areas here that you see are the lenses that produce the brighter star, stars. Uh, in the other areas, which you can't see in the photograph are actually little pinholes that project the, the other stars. Uh, we also, project the Milky Way. Uh, that's what this, this little set of uh, cells is doing. Now this is what we use to project our um, 
stars on the dome, but we actually give our presentations using uh, regular digital video projectors, uh, which we have three located in the planetarium that project up onto the dome uh, for the main, talk, main part of our uh, presentations. And then after our normal presentation, we uh, will turn the lights down and bring up the whole night sky for you. At the other end of the projector is what we call the planet cage. That's this area here. Uh, this is where we set the planets uh, where they are in the night sky. Uh, there's a series of gears and uh, little, little rods. And it's a very complicated uh, mechanism, very, uh, very engineering. <laughs> if you're into engineering, mechanical engineering, this is, this is something that is pretty, uh, pretty intense here. Uh, lots of, lots of stuff. Uh, we also uh, have little projectors. So this is what we use to set those, the planets. And we set uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the ones that can easily be seen with the naked eye. Uh, and then here we have uh, the projectors that actually project those uh, points on, on the dome. Here we have uh, a projector that projects the uh, coordinate system on our dome and one that also projects what we call the ecliptic. That's the imaginary line that the planets and the moon follow in the, as well as the sun through, through the sky. Now here's an image of the, inst uh, the installation of our dome. Uh, our dome is extremely unique. It's the only one in the world. Uh, it's not a true planetarium dome. Uh, you can't go out and buy one of these. This is actually a piece of Apollo space hardware. Uh, this is, uh, this dome was made by Rocketdyne in uh, Rocketdyne Corporation in California. It was designed to be a dummy bulkhead uh, for testing purposes uh, for the Saturn V rocket, uh, actually for the second stage uh, fuel tank. Uh, it's made out of cardboard, uh, like a, a cardboard and resin uh, honeycomb structure. Uh, it's, it's very strong, strong enough to handle, you know, take, rough handling during the testing procedures, but it was fairly light. And here's an image of what the, the dome uh, looked like at Marshall. Uh, this is part of the simulator for the Saturn V uh, rocket. Uh, this photo was taken back in 1964. And you can actually see the little, uh, looks like orange slices of, of the dome, just like you saw in the previous picture. Now let's, uh, now I mentioned, you know, all this stuff that the projector does, but uh, in order to do that, we have to pull the curtain back a little bit so you can see how that is actually accomplished. And we have a, a somewhat complicated console that controls the projector, which is you see here in the background. So we have uh, lots of dials and switches here and there that control uh, the various aspects of the projector where we can uh, change the the time of day and and the altitude the latitude of the of where you are uh, so you can see what the stars look like at the north pole or at the equator uh, or anywhere in between all right so now let's move on to the uh, current night sky um, if you went out about uh, 7 30 or so uh, and it was clear, this would be the view that you would have if you look due south. You'll see uh, bright objects in the south. Uh, you'll see Jupiter and Saturn, as well as the moon. Now the moon's a little bigger here in this uh, image. I did that so you could actually see the, the phase of the moon. It's not actually that big in the night sky. But we're a couple days past the first quarter, so it's a little more than half illuminated. And Frank Schenk will be talking about the moon here. Uh, and I think he's, the, he's got the next presentation. Uh, but Jupiter and Saturn are located in the constellation Sagittarius, which is pretty easy to spot. Uh, Sagittarius, the main part of the constellation looks like a teapot. Um, and we call it the teapot of Sagittarius, which is actually 
an asterism. The whole constellation is actually uh, more stars than what you see here. Uh, but the teapot stars are pretty bright, so they stand out. The moon is located in the constellation Capricornus, which is kind of a boat-shaped object or a boat-shaped constellation. Uh, and the stars in that constellation are a little bit dim, so with the moon being right there, you may not make out the, uh, the stars of Capricornus, but wait a day or two and then you might be able to, to see those stars a little bit. Also in the south is a pretty bright star uh, called Fummelhalt, and it's located in the constellation Pisces Austrinus, uh, which is the southern fish, and there it is. Now if we move east, uh, we'll see another bright object in, in the sky, and that's Mars. Uh, Mars and Earth have been uh, moving towards each other in their orbits uh, for the close approach that occurred back on October 6th. Uh, that was when Mars was about 38.6 million miles away from the Earth. Uh, and it's been poised for primetime viewing all, all month long and, and will be uh, for, for the foreseeable future for the next uh, month or two. Uh, it'll be uh, pretty prominent in the evening sky. Uh, it shines brilliantly in the constellation Pisces. That's this constellation here is the fishes. Mars will actually outshine Jupiter most of the month, uh, which is kind of unusual because Jupiter is a very bright planet and, in very, and the largest planet in the solar system. Now, you may not be able to make out the stars of Pisces if you live here in Huntsville, unless uh, it's a really unusual night that's clear and, and you're in a kind of a darker spot. You may have to go out to the, uh, out into the country to, to see Pisces from um, in all the detail because the stars are fairly dim. But you should be able to make out the stars of Pegasus and Andromeda. These stars are all pretty bright and uh, are easily visible uh, even from, you know, downtown Huntsville. Now, when there is a close approach uh, of Mars, like the, like the one that we're having right now. Uh, oftentimes you'll see on the internet some uh, bogus information that Mars is going to look as big as the moon in the night sky. And that's not true. It, there's no way that can, could happen. And if it, if it did, if it were true, we would be in a whole lot of trouble due to the gravitational pulls on the Earth and the moon and Mars. So it's not something we would want to occur. So here's Mars. Uh, this is actually an, uh, a composite image, a mosaic uh, that was taken uh, by the Viking orbiters, uh, orbiter, um, high resolution images. Uh, I think a hundred, a little over a hundred uh, images just to make this one mosaic. Right here in the center is something called the Valles Marineris. This is the uh, Mariner Valley, and it's a giant canyon. Uh, it's about uh, 2,500 miles long, so it, it covers about a fifth of the planet, or, or the distance around a fifth of the way around the planet. So to give it some perspective, imagine this canyon in the United States, it would reach from coast to coast. Uh, now, in comparison, the um, Grand Canyon is only about 500 miles long, um, and it's about one mile deep, whereas parts of the Valles Marineris are up to four miles deep. And the scientists think that this was actually formed uh, when the planet was cooling, the crust of the planet was cooling and it cracked. Off here to the left, you'll see these are actually volcanoes, the, uh, and they think that this region kind of rose up and caused, caused that crack to, to form. Uh, now, unfortunately from Earth, from a telescope, you don't really see this kind of detail. So um, unfortunately we need a, either the Hubble or um, Viking or the, you know, the images from the Viking orbiters uh, to, uh, to get this kind of a high resolution uh, view of the Valley Marineris. 
just a few facts about Mars. And I, I really just kind of wanted to point out Mars because there's been a lot about Mars in the news uh, since this is a close approach um, of Mars. Um, the Earth is about 93 million miles from the sun and Mars is about 142 million miles. And these are average numbers. Uh, now the Earth is zipping around the sun at a whopping 18 and a half miles per second. So hold on. And Mars is not a whole lot slower at 14.5 miles per second. The diameter is about, uh, Mars is a little more than half the diameter of the Earth. And the tilt of the axis is similar, 23 and a half degrees for Earth and 25 degrees for Mars. Now our year is 365 and a quarter days, whereas on Mars, it's actually 687 Earth years because it's a bigger, bigger orbit, longer orbit. The day is actually very, you know, very similar. Uh, our day is 23 hours, 56 minutes. We normally say 24 hours. And on Mars, it's 24 hours and 37 minutes, so about 24 hours. Now, the gravity on Mars is uh, considerably less than that of Earth. If you weighed, you know, 100 pounds on Earth, you would only weigh about 37 pounds on Mars. So, you know, that's, if you're looking to lose weight, head to Mars. Now, the average temperature is considerably colder on Mars than it is here on the Earth. Uh, our average temperature, this is global, is 57 degrees. And on Mars, that's minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very cold on Mars. And if that's the average, you can imagine the extremes. Uh, it does get very cold on Mars. Uh, and it does get a little bit warm, but not, not, like, uh, not like it does here in Alabama in the summer. The atmosphere is, uh, is somewhat different. Our atmosphere has a lot of nitrogen and oxygen, uh, whereas Mars has mostly carbon dioxide. Uh, we have a large moon and there are two small moons on, for Mars. So they're actually probably captured asteroids. Uh, this is just a quick uh, image of uh, Mars, the surface of Mars. So you can kind of see what it looks like. It's very rocky and a lot of boulders here and there. Uh, this is from the Pathfinder mission back in uh, 1997. Uh, we still have rovers and uh, devices on Mars uh, rolling around uh, looking at stuff. This was just a, a quick pick that I grabbed. So let's move to the north. We'll go back to the night sky to show you. Uh, if we were looking east and now we'll look north. Uh, you'll see probably the main constellation for the north is Ursa Minor, the little bear. And at the tip of the little bear's tail, that's his tail is Polaris. That's our North Star. Uh, and the Earth appears to, ro it appears to stay still as the Earth rotates underneath it. So the stars will move from east to west throughout the night and uh, Polaris will appear to stay still. Ursa Major, which contains the Big Dipper, uh, that's this shape here, uh, is kind of going below the horizon. So we won't really see it much during uh, the winter. It, it will pop back up uh, this spring though. You'll also see a uh, prominent W shape in the stars. These stars are pretty bright and this is the Cassiopeia the Queen. And just below Cassiopeia is the constellation Perseus, the hero. So. Now let's look overhead uh, this month. Uh, anytime this month uh, when you walk out, uh, again this is about 7.30 or so and you'll see uh, Three bright stars, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And these stars, uh, if you connect them, form a large triangle, and that's what we call the summer triangle. And it's, it starts being visible in the summer and is, in fact, uh, visible all through uh, most of the fall. And it's actually made up of three different constellations, um, Lyra, Cygnus, and Aquila. And here you can see there's Lyra. Cygnus and Aquila. Lyra is the lyre, that's a, a small harp. Cygnus is a swan and Aquila is an eagle. Also overhead uh, to the east you'll see Pegasus. This is the great square of Pegasus. These stars uh, kind of stand out 
And kind of attached here to Pegasus uh, is the constellation Andromeda. And speaking about Andromeda, uh, Andromeda, the constellation Andromeda is home to the farthest object that you can see with your naked eye. And that's the Andromeda galaxy. And it's located right here. It's fairly easy to find, uh, especially with binoculars. Uh, if you find this corner star of the great square of Pegasus, it's called Alpha Rats, which is, it's actually Andromeda, but it, it is attached to Pegasus. And you go to one, two, three, and then there's three more stars here. You go one, two, three, and right above that star is the Andromeda galaxy. And it is about two and a half million light years away. Now here's a photo. This is a VBAS image. I think this might be a Don Reed image. Uh, and that's a, a photo of the Andromeda galaxy. But if you look through a telescope, it's not going to look like that. Uh, here's kind of more likely what you'll see when you look through a telescope. Your eye just can't grasp all those photons that are two and a half million light years old or two and a half million years old that are hitting your eye. So uh, this is probably through a, about a 10 or 12 inch telescope. So a, a pretty large uh, amateur telescope before you kind of see this kind of detail. Now coming up here next weekend is Halloween. And on Halloween, the moon will be full. Uh, it'll be to the east of Mars. Here's Mars and there's the moon. Uh, and which is located in Pegasus, in uh, Pisces. Um, and you'll see the constellations, Pisces, Pegasus, Andromeda, Perseus, and Cassiopeia. Now the full moon on Halloween marks the second full moon this month, and that makes it a blue moon. So there, there really is nothing special about a blue moon other than it is the second full moon in a month, and that's what it's called. Uh, now this year, the full moon being on Halloween kind of makes it a little, little more of a spooky holiday. So, and that's it for this presentation. Uh, keep looking up at the night sky, whether you're using just your eyes, uh, a pair of binoculars, or a telescope. For more information about the Von Braun Astronomical Society, please visit our website at www.vbas.org. All right, turn it back to you, Eric, and if there's some questions or anything. Yeah, does anybody have any questions for uh, Jared? Uh, excellent presentation, by the way, and, and I love the video that uh, you've made and, and is on our YouTube uh, channel now. It's, it's really good. It covers uh, some of the material that you covered here, and uh, it's a great way to get uh, the word out to folks. Mm -hmm. Right, and hopefully we'll be able to do this in person, you know, sometime in the future. Eventually COVID will, yes. will kind of wane and we will be able to get back to having uh, public, uh, public outreach and, and activities at, at our facilities uh, again. But uh, hopefully for now, this, uh, this helps folks kind of see what's happening in the night sky. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, definitely good to see people um, um, on the uh, on the computer, but it's much more fun when we can actually meet in person and, and see the stars on the dome, and see them together out on the on the observing field. So, uh, Fred, uh, looks like you're sharing your screen. We're not quite ready for your presentation just yet. Uh, so, uh, next up is uh, is uh, uh, Frank Shank. Uh, with his presentation on observing, observing the moon. So uh, let's see. Frank. Okay, so you can see my screen because all I'm seeing here is like a black screen on, for my own screen. So anyway, that's good. Good enough. Yeah, okay. So I think uh, Frank's going to share his screen next. Do I need to stop sharing my screen or something? Or uh, probably actually, so. Yeah, this is the first Zoom meeting I've ever actually ever done. So, okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll yeah stop. Everybody sees your screen. So if you stop sharing, then uh, I think that'll allow. Uh, okay. Uh, 
Frank to uh, share his. All right. All right, here we go. All right, I will turn it over to Frank with his presentation on observing the moon. Frank, you're muted. Here we go. Okay, observing the moon. First of all, I'll give you some interesting facts about our moon. Speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. It takes about one second from the, for the light to get from, from the moon to us. Eight minutes for the sun, 71 minutes for Saturn, and then near, near a star, four years. Moon has phases. Goes anywhere from new where you don't see the moon at all. It's right in front, almost in front of the sun, all the way up to first quarter, full, third quarter, back to new. Takes approximately a month. The month actually came from the word moon, month, moon. The moon also causes, the moon together with the sun causes tides on the earth causes the ocean to rise and fall. And when the sun and the moon work together, you have higher tides. When the sun and the moon don't work together, you have you know, less extreme tides. I grew up five miles from the ocean, so I know a lot about tides. The moon has an elliptical orbit. Sometimes it's closer and sometimes it's farther. This gives rise to a supermoon. If the moon is actually very close to the Earth, you're going to see it in the, everything in the news about a supermoon. If the moon is very far from the Earth, you'll see nothing about it. It's called a micromoon. I didn't even know that until I read about it, because you never hear about a micromoon. You always hear about supermoon. And the Earth moon system is unique in our solar system. And the reason is the moon is not the largest satellite of any planet, but in relation to our planet, the moon is actually quite large. Here's our solar system. Our solar system made up of four tiny little planets and four giant planets. The four tiny little planets, Mercury does not have a moon. Venus does not have a moon. Mars has two tiny little rocks. Hard to even qualify for being moons. I probably just asteroids that got lost. The four giant planets have fairly large moons, as you might expect. And Earth has a moon, which is in the same class as the giant planet moons. Here's our moon compared to the moons of Jupiter. I mean, our moon fits right in with Jupiter's moons as far as size goes. And Titan and Saturn, our moon is bigger than the moons of uh, Uranus and Neptune. So it's actually fairly large. There's probably a reason for this. This is how we think the moon was formed. A long time ago, billions of years ago, a planet about the size of Mars called Theia crashed into the earth. This planet crashing into the earth caused a lot of material from the earth to fly into space and eventually became our moon. And we can only see one side of the moon. The moon is tidally locked. It rotate, 
The moon rotates as fast as it goes around us. We all can see the one side. And we had no idea what the other side of the moon looked like until back in the 1960s, when the Russians sent a rocket out to, to look at the other side of the moon. And it's totally different than the side that we're familiar with. Okay, what do you need for observing the moon? You can see prominent lunar features even with a very small telescope. My first telescope was 62 millimeters, two and a half inches. I've kind of got bigger telescopes since then. Right now I have a 14 inch telescope. But even with a small telescope, you can see features on the moon. Just take a small telescope, and maybe about a 50, 50 power, you'd be able to see all kinds of things, all kinds of detail on the moon. The best views of the moon are somewhere around first quarter or the last quarter, if you don't mind getting up at three o'clock in the morning, because we have shadows. Lone Terminator, the, the uh, dividing line between the uh, dark part of the moon and the light part, that's where you're going to see the most detail. You look along the Terminator. Full moon, you can't hardly see anything in a full moon. Everything is just all washed out. Never forget when I first got a telescope, everybody was, all the people would tell me, oh, you got a full moon tonight, isn't it wonderful? Yeah, I just shake my head, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. First quarter is, is much better than a full moon. Crescent moons are really nice also, but they're kind of close to the sun. You really don't have very much time to see them. The moon is made up of uh, what, when people first looked at the moon with telescopes, they saw these dark areas and they called them seas and oceans. You know, sea of showers, sea of serenity, sea of tranquility. They're actually lava plains, they're not seas. That's what they thought they were back in the, you know, Galileo's time. They thought they were seas or oceans. And here's, here's one very nice, uh, nice sea, the Sea of Crises, three, three days after a full moon. I just took this picture last week. And here's another sea, Sea of Rainbows, about 11 days after full moon. These are probably some of the nicest ones on the moon. And like I said, you can see these seas even with a small telescope. You can see most of these craters with a small telescope. The moon has mountains. Here's the lunar Apennines, probably the most spectacular mountain range on the moon. I mean, you look at these things, you can tell right away, quarter million miles away, you can tell they're mountains. And they're actually pretty big mountains. Here's the lunar Alps. And, a little, and there's the Alpine, what they call the Alpine Valley, running right between the Alps Mountains. Craters. They used to think craters on the moons were caused by volcanoes, but now we know they are caused by meteorite impacts. This is Copernicus, very prominent crater, 58 miles in diameter. And these craters, these large craters were formed when meteors hit and the, the explosion of the meteor impact was so hard it caused these peaks to come up in the middle of the crater. All the large craters have these peaks caused by, the, caused by the impact. Some of the smaller craters do not have peaks, but all the large craters do have peaks because of tremendous force of the impact. Here's a crater that doesn't have any peaks. What happened? This crater was a crater that did have peaks a long time ago. And then it got flooded with lava. And after being flooded with lava, it's nice and smooth. It looks like it's almost like a lake. And then after, after it was flooded with lava, it got a few more meteorite impacts. And you can see it's, it's you know, a few small craters on there. This is the crater of Plato. It's a, again, a very, very prominent crater on the moon. Fairly easy to find, 68 miles in diameter. 
probably a little bit after the first quarter, you can find it. There's some other craters you can see. Crater on the right, definitely a flooded, flooded crater. Crater on the upper left, an impact crater where you can see the central peaks. Here's, here's three, three craters in a row. It's very, very picturesque. You can see it's right after first quarter. Again, even with a small telescope, you can see these craters. Another thing the, lunar, the moon has is lunar domes. Domes are, are shield volcanoes. They're extinct volcanoes. They're not, you know, not spewing out any lava, but they're very old. And I find these two, these two domes are very, very uh, prominent. They're very easy to see. They're about 20 kilometers wide. One, one is 800 meters, the other is 150 meters high. Uh, these domes would be like Montesano. This is what Montesano would look like if it was on the moon. The lunar domes, you can only see them when they're close to the Terminator. These domes are very prominent. You could probably see them two nights in a row. Most domes you can only see for one night. The next night they'll be washed out. They're not that high. They have very, very, very uh, narrow sl slope. You can only see them close to the Terminator. Here's some other domes. These are right near Copernicus. It's a very large dome field near Copernicus. And on this night, they were very, very easily visible. The next night, you couldn't even probably hardly find them. Another feature in the moon is rills. These are collapsed lava tubes. These are, these are beautiful set of rills. Again, these you can only again see when they're fairly close to the Terminator. You can tell we're close to the Terminator by looking at the crater on the lower left. It's almost filled with shadow. Here's another rill. Here's two very interesting craters. The craters were formed by impact. They were flooded with lava. And then rills formed in the lava. Craters Cassini and Posidonius, some of the most interesting craters on the moon. I love looking at these craters. Okay, I've, I'm asked this question all the time. What can you not see on the moon? Well, I'm asked, can you see the American flag? Can you see the Apollo lander? No, you cannot see him. The Hubble Space Telescope cannot see him. The moon is a quarter million miles away. The Hubble Space Telescope is maybe 100 miles closer than we are. It doesn't make much difference when you're a quarter million miles. The typical camera has thousands or millions of pixels. An area the size of a football field on the moon would cover one pixel on your camera. And you're not going to get a picture of anything that covers one pixel. Now you can see the uh, Apollo landers and everything, and with the lunar Rec lunar reconnaissance orbit reconnaissance orbiter camera, which is 100 miles above the moon, it actually goes between 12 to 103 miles from the moon. And this orbiting satellite around the moon, you can see it. So from, from that distance, you could see it. And here's actually, you can see some of the trails when they were using one of the uh, lunar buggy going back and forth for Apollo 17 landing site. And if you're interested in looking at the moon, is moon is something called the Lunar 100 card. It's the 100 most interesting features on the moon. And in the next presentation, Don Martin is going to be talking about the Astronomical League.
about Mess the Messier uh, Award for the Astronomical League. The, the Astronomical League also has a lunar award where you look at and, and uh, record the lunar 100 objects. And it gives you something, you know, it gives you an idea what to look for on, on the moon. And the one interesting thing about the moon is, I should have mentioned this before, every night it is totally different. Every night you look at the moon, just a different story. The Terminator moves, fairly large amount. Craters, which were very prominent inside of shadow one night. Next night, those craters would be out right, right out in the bright sunlight. So as, as you can tell, I'm, I'm really interested in the moon. I love looking at the moon. Okay, thank you very much. That's my presentation. Any questions? Excellent presentation, uh, Frank. Does anybody have a question? Yes, I have a question. This is Tom Darrington. Frank, uh, is there any seismic activity on the moon today, or was there ever? I don't think they've ever discovered much seismic activity. Uh, very little, if anything. They're continuously, for years, we've been looking for um, changes on the moon, and, and especially volcanic activity. We never found anything. Every once in a while, people think they found something or saw something, sometimes just a flash of light, but uh, I think it's pretty much dead. I, I just read a uh, article in the December uh, Sky and Telescope uh, in the Lunar Observing section where they talk about some bright uh, rocks on the tops of these ridges that had come out, and so they think they're relatively recent, and they think that could potentially be a sign of some seismic or selenitic activity, however you say that. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, you know, it's not certain by any any means. And, you, you know, I don't know that you could see those uh, with a telescope from Earth. Uh, I have to relook the article, but um, they're, they're, they're hoping for the day when they can have a, a series of uh, seismic sensors on the moon to be able to resolve that question because they really don't know i guess so the uh lava flows that filled the craters were they uh i guess they long uh solidified oh yeah a long time ago yeah very long time ago a billion years or so i think right yeah Tom Burrell no in the chat says that there are lunar quakes, but they're much smaller in magnitude than on Earth. Yeah, they talk about a lot of the lava flows that fill the craters. I mean, they're talking about very, you know, very ancient times. Okay, we probably were running a little bit behind time. We probably should turn it over to uh, Don for the next presentation. Thanks, Frank, that was awesome. Uh, Don, uh, you're up next. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and get the recording set up here. And now I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and I guess I'll share that one. Did I get the wrong one? No, this is the one. It's the introduction to the Astronomical League. Do you guys see that? Yep. Okay. So my name is Don Martin. Uh, I'm the current president of VBAS. I'm also uh, the... Sorry, I think we're seeing Frank's screen, aren't we? Um, there's shared access. If you go to view options, there's All two right. options available. Here it is. I got it. Stop share. Okay. Got it. Okay. Now we're seeing... Now we see uh, Astronomical Okay, we were seeing both, I think. I, don't, I mean, I could see Frank's also, so that was kind of weird. But anyway, all right, uh, so my name is Don Martin. I'm the president of VBAS. Uh, I'm also the editor for the newsletter, and I uh, am the coordinator for the, uh, the SIG that meets on the first Friday of every month. So you're welcome to join us for those things if you want. And let's see what's going on here. 
that's not right. Hang on a second here. Let's see if I can work this out. Okay, and then we switch. How's that? I think we got it. Okay, so um, so oh boy, maybe not. There we go. So the Astronomical League, what is the Astronomical League? Uh, well, it's, it's basically a club of clubs. It's an organization that uh, kind of uh, functions as sort of a hub for all the clubs in the United States. Uh, VBAS is a member society, and so consequently, VBAS members are members. Um, what they do, one of the things that they do is they promote Astronomy Day. I think they were the ones who originated the concept of Astronomy Day. And they have a number of programs that they also promote to encourage people to actually go out and look at stuff. Uh, one of the most prominent ones they have is the Messier program. You've heard about the Messier objects and all that. We're going to get into that in a few minutes. Uh, their website is astroleague.org. I encourage you to uh, take a look at that as soon as you can, or any chance, as soon as you get a chance to do that. They have, uh, eight, what, what, they have 80 different programs, and these programs are basically, they are... Uh, lists of different types of objects, um, but a little bit more than that, because they also tell you what to look for and, and what notes to take. And so they kind of tell you, you know, here's how you have to make your observations and look for things like this. So it is a, they have these different programs. And uh, some, of these, some of these programs are quite challenging. Some of them are relatively simple. They have some that are suitable for school age children. And they have some that would be challenging to uh, an engineer or scientist with a 20 inch or 25 inch telescope. Uh, sometimes they are for historic events like transits, like the Mercury transit had its own program and uh, or eclipses, comets, things that are transient type events. Uh, they, most of them will specialize, they focus on different types of objects like globular clusters or planetary nebula Galaxies with active nuclei, that's a kind of a, a special, a pretty, pretty narrowly defined uh, program. Some of them are constellations, like there's one called Constellation Hunter, and you look at constellations, and others are, are for planets, and the planetary ones are kind of interesting, the solar system one, because you've got to observe uh, the apparition of, for example, of a planet, uh, let's say three or four times, that can take a couple of years. So it's not, uh, these are not, uh, you know, you go out and you do it in an evening. Some of these can take a couple of years. They're not necessarily difficult, but you've got to be organized. You've got to take notes. You've got to do things a certain way. And so it is a bit challenging to do this stuff. Uh, you don't need to be a member to get the programs or to get the list of objects. Uh, but if you complete it and you submit your observations, they give you like a little certificate and a pin and all this stuff. So, so if you want to get that stuff, you need to be a member one way or another. But um, you don't need to be to get the list of objects and start having some fun with stuff like this. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give just sort of an overview of what these programs are to show the, the, the incredible range of skill, equipment, and the different types of objects that we can observe with these things. There's, there's just a tremendous variety of things. You know, some of these are really easy. Some of them are really difficult. Some of them require really elaborate equipment like a, a hydrogen alpha telescope or a large aperture Dobsonian. Uh, some of them, you know, they'll get you, they just get you to look at double stars or variable stars or make observations. And some of these, uh, like for example, a variable star one in particular, you make the observations and then you submit those observations to the AAVSO, which uh, then can use those as actual data. So it's a citizen science project and, uh, you can actually contribute to that and, and be uh, uh, and make these contributions uh, to that are helpful to uh, professional scientists. <clears throat> so the program uh, typically the seeing, the transparency, the temperature, what eyepiece you use, what your aperture of telescope is, what the magnification was. Sometimes you have to sketch things. Sometimes you can use a camera to make an image and you have to take some kind of little quick note typically. Um, and they give you a list of objects. So the, the idea is you're gonna go through this list of objects and take down the required notes. And then they tell you how many you have to observe. Like typically it's 70 of them, 70 for, for the Messier, you have to do 70 of 110. 
Okay, so that's uh, that's pretty challenging. That's pretty difficult because you got to you got to dance around the weather. You got some of them are really faint, so you've got to go somewhere darker than your backyard and things like that. <clears throat> so the Mesialis, this is the uh, I think this was the very first one, the one that started it all. Uh, and you have to observe visually 70 Messier objects, and you have to keep a record of your observation. Uh, your notes have to include, as I was saying before, the date and time, the latitude and longitude, well, that's just your location, seeing and transparency, the size of your telescope, the power used, and, just, and then a, a brief description as it appears to you in the eyepiece. Um, and and the, the kicker to this is you can't use go-to telescopes or digital setting circles. You heard Jeff talking about digital setting circles and stuff like it. You can't, you can't use those. You have to actually sky hop or you start what's called star hopping, where you, you point it at a bright object like a bright star, and then you look in your finder and you say, okay, I'm going to go down a little bit and over a little bit, and, and then it'll be right there. And so you have to do that. And the idea behind that is it kind of gets you to sort of learn the sky. So you're not just pushing a button you know, it's not like looking at it online. You have to go out and, and get to know the night sky. And that's, and that's kind of the point of these programs is to get you out and, and observing things. And, and you know, I, I, tend, I tend to think of this not so much as science as nature appreciation. It's like going for a hike in the woods and you want to get to know the different kinds of trees, the different kinds of flowers. What are you looking at? Uh, maybe you're into geology and you want to see the, the, the mountains and what kind, of, what kind of rock the mountains are made out of. That's what we're doing here is we're, we're kind of trying to get a sort of a layman's understanding of the universe. Um, the um, <clears throat> Astronomical League has a number of publications, and I, you can see one of them right here, the Messier Objects, a Beginner's Guide. That is, uh, that is sold by the Astronomical League for $8, so you can always get that. There are free guides, however, and there's something called the, uh, the Ultimate Messier Object Log, or TUML, T-U-M-O-L. That's what people call it. Uh, and it is really, uh, it is really remarkable. If you look at this page on the right, uh, this shows you what they what they've got. They, it shows you the information about it. It shows you the RA and the deck. If you can, uh, if you can see that towards the center, it shows, shows you the location. Shows you how big it is, how bright it is. Gives you all this information. It even tells you what star, what page it is on for the Sky Atlas 2000 and other star charts. So. Um, so that's a really useful guide, and that's a free download. If anybody wants this, uh, you can send me an email. Uh, and, and it also shows you this map down below, so you can see exactly where it is. It shows, shows you a map of Sagittarius and Scorpius, and it shows you exactly where it is with the, um, uh, the circles, uh, the, the, the Telrad circles in there. So you can even use the, just position the large Telrad circle around the constellations like that, and you should be able to pop up, bring, bring it right in. So it's, it's a really useful guide. This thing over here on the left, um, I think that was the, the cover screen of an app that was, uh, that was uh, produced. And it used to be that you could, uh, you had a little app. He had a, he had a, a free app that allowed you to um, sort through. It was just, a, it was the same thing as in the, in the object log, but it was an app, it was in an app format. And then in the upper left corner here, you can see that's the pin that you get if you, if you do it. Now that pin right there, that's, that's kind of confusing looking, right? You look at it and it looks like a wig or something. But if you follow it closely, and I actually went to the trouble of doing this, that is actually Messier's signature, believe it or not. If you go through and trace it out, it says M-E-S-S-I-E-R. You may find it hard to believe, but that's what, it's, that's what it says there. So that was his signature. That's why they put that on the pen. <clears throat> um, when you do this, you need to have some kind of an observing log. This one on the right is one that I made myself. And um, it, it's what it does recording the stuff. Uh, it allows you to say, for example, which scope you're using. Those are the scopes that I've got available to me date site but NELM is naked eye limiting magnitude so that's the darkest uh, that's the faintest star you can see from that location for my backyard it's about four four and a half from Kenimer it's about six and a half so you pick up two magnitudes if you go out to our Kenimer dark sky site <clears throat> and then it also talks about the seeing and the transparency and, and so on and so forth 
Uh, there's a little spot for making a sketch if you want to make that a finder scope or, or what you see through the eyepiece. The object you're locating and then the, the time and then, then there's room for some little notes and stuff like that. Um, the other thing that I put on here is, is uh, all my eyepieces and the magnification uh, for each eyepiece uh, and uh, for each scope. So you can look at it, my 11 inch in my, my 11 millimeter eyepiece and my 12 and a half, half uh, inch scope gives me a magnification of about 139 times. So that makes it real easy. You can just circle it and say, that's what I was, that's the magnification. And, and then on the right here, those are the filters that I like to use. The NPB, the, uh, an O3 filter for planetary nebula, and then an OSG is a Ryan Sky Glow, which is uh, an, uh, something you can get over at the at, at Ryan uh, Telescope. So uh, then, you know, what, what I can do with this, the nice, the nice thing about this is, is you, you get this, it's all, all ready to go, and then when you're done, you can just scan it in and, and email it to the uh, coordinator for the Astronomical League, uh, or, or Whoever's going to like check your work and make sure you did it right and everything like that. Okay, so let's go to uh, some of the other programs here. This one is really good for school age children. It's called Sky Puppy. And uh, the idea is it's for, it's for young kids to get familiar with the night sky. And hopefully they eventually graduate from Sky Puppy and they become a more experienced observer and they can work on other, other uh, league programs. So, uh, this is something that probably parents would want to do with their kids. So they have to do things like identify 15 constellations. Well, you know, that's something that a lot of adults can't do. Okay. I mean, uh, that's, that's a good way of getting to know your way around the night sky to find the brighter stars, uh, Betelgeuse, for example, or Vega, you know, the really bright stars. This is just getting to know your way around the night sky and it would really be good for even an adult to do this. And I don't, I don't think there's any, any shame in being, I mean, if an adult were to do this, you don't necessarily need to get the pin or anything, but to, 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 to download this and go through the, the objects and figure out, you know, where these things are, like find the M42, find the Andromeda galaxy, find the Pleiades, the Hyades. I mean, these are not, uh, these are not difficult things to find, but it does take a little bit of an effort, uh, a little bit of dedication to find them. And once you've done it, you go outside and it's like being able to find, uh, you know, a Jefferson pine or, or an Indian paintbrush uh, flower and things like that. You know, it's, it's the basic understanding of what's in the night sky. It's the other side of nature. Instead of looking at things on the ground, you're looking up, in, up into the night sky. Uh, and then you have to, of course, find the Milky Way. Most people could probably do that. Polaris. And then you have to keep a log, which is really a, a good act of discipline whenever you're doing all of this stuff. And, when it's all done, you didn't just go out and waste two hours uh, doodling around. You know, you've got something to show for it. You've got, you've got, uh, you've got a, a, it's a focused activity. It's not just uh, rambling around and doing whatever. So then the next, uh, the next one up would be uh, Constellation Hunter. And then for each constellation, I think you have to do this for every constellation visible in the, in the northern, every, every constellation that's visible in the northern hemisphere, I believe, uh, north of the celestial equator. And, and again, you have to provide a certain amount of data, you know, record the date and the time and the latitude and longitude, the name of the constellation. You need to make a sketch of the stars in it and, and, then, and then draw the lines between the stars. So for example, if you're drawing Sagittarius, you want to draw the teapot and, and that sort of thing. And then they also have another one. Uh, this is uh, the Constellation Hunter Northern. They have also got the Constellation Hunter, uh, the Southern version of it. <clears throat> so there's, uh, there's uh, one for people in the Southern Hemisphere. So if you happen to be down in Australia for a couple of weeks or a month or whatever, you can uh, maybe work on, that, uh, work on it down there. one of the programs and this one is this one I did this one it took me I think four years uh, it didn't really it, it didn't really take four years as much as I, I just stopped working on it for a while uh, but it is a, it is quite challenging they give you a list of, of uh, I think it's 50 objects and they want you to go through uh, there's there's different elements of it some things you do with the naked eye some things you do with binoculars and some things you have to do with the telescope 
So for example, with an unaided eye, you have to locate the man in the moon and they want you to draw a little sketch, the cow jumping over the moon, uh, the waning crescent moon, uh, Mare Tranquillitatis, which is, which is one of the, uh, the brighter, uh, I shouldn't say brighter, but one of the more prominent craters on the moon. And with binoculars, you have to be able to find, a, a, and this was quite difficult. This was, uh, uh, I had to put the binoculars on a tripod and, and really get a good look to, to do this program. Fracastorius, Aristoteles, and, and a few things like this. When you do this program, um, you need a map. You really do need a map. You can download, um, you can download uh, free apps, or some of them might be two or three bucks, something like that. But you want something so that you can zoom in on it, and and you can and you can locate uh, a crater, or you can locate like Sinus Estuum. Well, do you know where Sinus Estuum is by by memory? I mean, I don't know where it is. I found it once, but that doesn't mean I could pick it off from memory. So that's why they make maps. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, to get a book. Uh, I don't, uh, I'll, I'll show you. I've got some books here. I'll show you at the end. But I've got one here. It's called Atlas of the Moon by Charles Wood and Maurice Collins. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't want to contradict Frank, but the, uh, this program is not connected to the Lunar Woods 100, the Lunar 100. <coughs> the Lunar 100 is a good program that was published in Sky and Telescope. And this atlas of the moon that I've got here is connected. It shows you where the Lunar 100 are on close-up maps. In fact, it uses images, photographs from the LRO that Frank was talking about, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Magnificent photos. Absolutely fantastic map. I think it was like 15 bucks or something like that. Uh, I'll take that back. It says 29 on the back of the book. So it was a little bit on the pricey side. But it was really useful for finding a lot of these, a lot of these uh, craters that you can't uh, find anywhere else. Okay, so then here's another one. <clears throat> Again, we're focusing on the beginning programs right here. This is called the Universe Sampler, and it's just sort of like a cross section of different things that you can look at uh, through your telescope. It's just it's designed to give the new observer uh, an overview of what to look at. I mean, this would be a really if you just got a new telescope. This would be a good one to start with, uh, just to go through and, uh, and just see what there is to see. Just to kind of like, it, it's in the same level as Turn Left at Orion or the other book that someone was talking about earlier. You know, these, these books that just kind of get you, get you started, get you kind of jump started in this hobby. And again, um, it's got a list of program, a list of objects. I don't know how many it is off the top of my head, but then you can see in the upper left corner, uh, the little pin that you get uh, after you've completed this thing. <clears throat> Here's another one with a kind of a funny name, Galileo's Toad. What does that mean? Well, Toad means transits, occultations, eclipses, and shadows. But this is, this is a really interesting one. Uh, and it's one I, I kind of like, I kind of wish I jumped on it before, uh, before uh, Jupiter went away. But um, the idea is to look at the moons of Jupiter which are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And occasionally those moons are, are so well aligned or they, they pass in front of the surface of Jupiter and, they, and either you can see the moon against the background of Jupiter or, and that's called a transit, or you can see an occultation when one of the moons moves behind Jupiter, or you can see an eclipse, which is when one of the moons moves into the shadow of Jupiter or you can see shadow transits, which is when the shadow of one of the moons moves across the face of Jupiter. Typically, the shadow transits and the transits go, go together. They'll be, they'll be very closely, uh, very near the same evening. Typically, they'll be the same evening. So then each of these events has a start and a finish, an ingress and an egress. And they want you to, uh, to time these things and record your data and, and do all that sort of thing. Here is uh, another program. This one is called the Caldwell Project. Uh, the Caldwell program. Now the Messier list is 110. So this is intended to be parallel to the Messier list. <laughs> but um, the Messier list, when Messier compiled it, it was a black list. It was a list of things to kind of stay away from. But we use it as a white list today. Well, that means that a lot of the things that we would uh, like to have on the Messier list, you might say that Messier missed them. Only he didn't really miss them. 
like for example, the Heides. Well, he didn't miss the Heides. He just didn't take it look like a comet. Well, Caldwell, Patrick Moore, uh, went through and he, he put together a list of things that uh, would go on a white list that, that aren't on the Messier list. So he went through and he picked up a whole bunch of stuff uh, that he thought should be on a, on a go-to list, a white list of objects that you might want to observe. So it, it mirrors the Messier list, it complements the Messier list, but you should understand that some of these objects are not easy. They're not, I mean, the, there's things on the Messier list that are difficult. The stuff on this list are, some of them are really difficult. You really need to be in a dark location. Some of them you can only see from uh, southern latitudes. Now when Messier put together the, his list, he did the whole thing from, uh, from France, which is a mid-northern latitude. So the stuff that's in the southern hemisphere completely missed. He didn't see any of that stuff. So, he, so, so when Caldwell Moore put this together, he put C1 is, is within uh, a degree or two of, the, uh, of Polaris. It's not far from Polaris. And it goes all the way down to 102. 102 is near, it's in octants near the South Celestial Pole. So they are in almost, there's a few exceptions, but they basically go from one in the north to 109 in the south. Um, and uh, so some of them you can't see, you can't see them all. So you can't, you can't complete the list really, unless you travel to Australia or New Zealand or South America or something like that. Uh, I went down to uh, the Florida Keys last February and I was able to get down to 102. Some of them I couldn't see because uh, they weren't, they either weren't up or it was cloudy the night I was trying to see them. But you can get down to about 102, but there's that last seven you're not going to, you're not going to pick up until you travel. Um, but they do include spectacular objects like the double cluster, which is not a, it's not a Messier object. Yeah, it includes the Veil Nebula, the Hyades, the North American Nebula, the Helix Nebula. These are great objects. These are great objects that uh, just aren't on the Messier list. And, and so it's good to have this list as a go-to list for, for some, of the, some of the brighter objects. Now here's something that's uh, maybe a little bit more difficult. I think they rate it as a as a uh, as an intermediate uh, program. So it is the the Messier list, but not all the Messier objects can be seen in a pair of ten by fifty binoculars. So what do you do then? Well, what they did was they they have this script down list, uh, and they get they they pick up the the Messier. If you look at the the, on the left side here, Appendix A, you go down below that, the easier Messier objects, that's 42 and you need 50 to do this. So there's 42, so you've got to pick up some of these tougher objects uh, in order to get up to the 50 uh, with, a t with 10 by 50 binoculars. So um, anyway, that's the list of objects, that's the way it looks. If you have larger binoculars, they have a different, uh, a different list over here, and they give you they give you a list of targets, and you can see uh, that the obviously the easier objects uh, are there's a lot more. There's 58, uh, so you can get all 50 just on the e on the easy list. But uh, you can I would I would encourage someone doing this to try a couple of the tougher objects. You know, I was able to see uh, the uh, the M1 in. Uh, Seven by fifty, but ten by fifty binoculars. It was it was not easy. It, I, I mean, it took me probably uh, several attempts, and then finally, I think I saw it at uh, at French Camp. I think we were down in French Camp, which is a pretty dark location we like to go to. There's also an asteroid program, and again, you know, you see the pins are always in the upper left corner. Those are the pins that they'll give you when you get these little uh, awards. Um, so the Asteroid Observers Program is to encourage people to look at uh, asteroids. You know, one of the things about asteroids is that uh, they're, because they're point-like objects, uh, they can produce in the air. So they don't suffer from light pollution as much as a deep sky object, some kind of nebula. You can, you can actually see these asteroids in your backyard. So this would be a good one to do if you were like trapped in your backyard or, or if for some reason you have a telescope that doesn't travel well. Um, 
one of the things that's nice about asteroids is that they are they move. You can see them moving from night to night. So you, you can what you, what you typically would do is is look at the field of view and then either make a sketch or take a picture, and then a couple of nights later you go back and you revisit it, and you take another picture and it's in a different location, and you can see this night to night. It's not it's not a, a subtle effect. You can really see these things moving night to night. So. So it is, uh, it is really an interesting program from that standpoint. Uh, you need uh, 25 to get uh, the certificate and 100 asteroids to get the pin. You know, there's an awful lot of asteroids out there too. It's not like you're gonna have trouble finding these things. If you have a program like Sky Safari, it'll, it downloads updated ephemeris, ephemeri for, for these asteroids and it will show you uh, exactly where they are. So, uh, it would be difficult to do this with a paper atlas, but if you had, if you download, if you get Sky Safari, or I'm sure that there are other programs that will do the same thing. You can, you can do this, you can find things, and it would be, uh, it would be an awesome project to work on. And, and if you'll notice it, it, they're saying a four inch or a six inch scope. So you can do this with a relatively modest, uh, with relatively modest equipment. You don't need an eight inch scope or 10 inch or 12 or whatever. So, um, so that's a pretty good thing. So what I want to do now is I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through these in detail. You get the basic idea of what you have to do here for these programs. Here are some of the other more advanced programs, comets. Now comets are very difficult because they're, they're very uh, tenuous and difficult to see a lot of them, but there's always a lot of comets up in the sky. If you're in a dark location, there's probably 50 comets. Out. If you could go outside right now, there's probably 50 comets that you could look at, you could theoretically look at. Uh, the Lunar 2 is, is like the Lunar program I showed you before, but, but it is a lot more difficult. It requires you to sketch craters. It requires you to sketch the full moon. Uh, it, is, it is a much more demanding program. The double stars, they've got double star programs for both binocular and telescopes. Globular clusters, you know, I just, I've got the book for the globular cluster program. That is a very difficult program. Uh, they give you a list of about 200 globular clusters and you have to find 50 of them. Now you stop and think about that. You only have to have a 25% success rate on these things. Some of these globular clusters, they're asking you to observe globular clusters in other galaxies. So you have to look at the Andromeda Nebula and figure out which dot is a, is a, is a globular cluster. Or go to M101 or M33 and try to locate globular clusters around in another galaxy, a different galaxy. That's a real challenge. Uh, they've also got open clusters. They've got, you can do it visually or photographically. Uh, planetary nebula, that's what I'm working on right now. I'm at about 35 uh, objects right now. And the nice thing about that one that I have found is that you don't need a really dark location to see a lot of these. A lot of planetary nebula are really small. If it's a really large diffuse one, I tried to see the Helix Nebula the other night, uh, no luck. Filters didn't help. Um, but you can see a lot of planetary nebula that are tiny objects or they're small and round and you can actually see a little bit of color in them. You can typically see a little bluish glow sometimes. Radio astronomy. Now there's, this is one um, that some people have talked, people have been talking lately about uh, radio astronomy and having a radio astronomy SIG or a group of people that get together and they want to do radio astronomy stuff together. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, maybe contact me and, and I'll put you in touch with some people who have expressed interest in this. But there is a radio astronomy uh, program for the Astronomical League, so you guys can maybe work on that sort of thing together. Galaxy clusters, again, you're looking at like Hicks and galaxies. Uh, active galactic nuclei, the Herschel 400, that's one that I'm kind of uh, spinning up on right now. It's it's parallel to the Messier list, but it's 400 objects and they're virtually all galaxies. 80 to 90 percent of them are galaxies. Um, so they're very faint. You need dark skies to see it. The people who do that typically go to regional star parties in West Texas or places like that, Oklahoma, someplace super dark and they and they knock it out. They, they'll, they'll go there, uh, they'll spend a few days at a regional star party and they'll do, do maybe a hundred 50 objects and they'll do that three or four times and that's how they get that's how they do that list. Herschel 2 is like the Herschel 400 but it is uh, the next 400 so it's 400 that are fainter or more obscure Herschel 400 
And then they've also got some other that are a little bit more obscure, Carbon Stars, uh, Galactic Neighbors, and there's, there's 80 programs. All, all told, there's about 80 programs. Um, so you can get guidebooks, a lot of books that will tell you more about the programs and give you tips on how to see these things. But uh, the best way is to come to the SIG on the first Friday at VBAS. You and I can talk. We can talk. If, if it wasn't for the Zoom stuff, we could talk face to face. Um, and again, the lists are all free to download. So go out to astroleague.org and start looking for the observing programs. And also, we have got, I want to make sure we understand this, there's two places locally that you can go observe. One is the VBAS observing field. If you're a member, we can give you the gate code, and you can go in there whenever you want and observe on the field. And the second is Kenimer, which is 20, uh, I said 20 minutes here. It's about 20 minutes uh, from downtown uh, Huntsville, I'd say. Um, so you can get there pretty quickly and set up, get there, you know, an hour before dark, set up, and then when it gets dark, you're ready to go. It's down uh, by, by New Hope or Paint Rock. Uh, and then finally, I think that was it. I had one more, I had one more slide and I think I deleted, I deleted that slide earlier because it wasn't really pertinent. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna stop sharing my slide. And what I wanna do now is, I wanna show you guys some of these observing guides that I've got here. Um, I've got one here. I don't know if you guys can see. I'm going to have to turn off my background uh, real quick here. Uh, choose virtual background. Let me turn this off real quick. None. Okay, there we go. So here we've got, um, this is one of the books that I've got. I don't know if you can see this. It's the Herschel 400. So you can see what these books are like. Uh, if you want to take a look at it sometime, I, I, I can show it to you. But you can see it lists the objects. It tells you what type it is, the size, the magnitude, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so it's a, it's a helpful guide and it also gives you tips on how to observe things. It's got a few charts, uh, not really a lot, but uh, it's got a few charts. Um, and then uh, here's the Planetary Nebula program that I've been working on. So this is also uh, pretty helpful. It's got, uh, this one's nice because it's got images of the object. So you can look at it and see, well, is it large or is it small? Is it a star-like object? Does it have some nebulosity? So if it's a, if it's a stellar object, I'll, I'll take a stab at it in my backyard. If it's got nebulosity, you can just forget it. Um, this is the Herschel 2 observing guide. This is also a really good guide. This one has got, uh, you know, these books are all written by different people. So they've all got different stuff in them. This one has got things like, uh, uh, it's got some observing notes in it. You know, this one says, averted vision, slightly oval with even surface brightness across the face, faded and diffuse outer edges, and so on. So it's giving you observing uh, uh, notes and things like that. So that's pretty useful. And then you probably would have liked this one about a month ago. This one is on Mars. And it talks about filters and what you can see on Mars, what you can notice about it. It's got one here. I've got one here on Jupiter. Here's the one on globular clusters. And uh, this one, this globular cluster, these guys are crazy. Um, you have to note the, uh, the, the concentration of the cluster and, and so on and so forth. This is a really hard uh, program I'm finding out and I can't do it in my backyard. I, I, I mean, you can see some of the brighter, uh, the brighter ones, but you can't see a lot of them. A lot of them are just really faint. And then here's one more book I wanna recommend. It's called The Atlas of the Moon. This is really an outstanding book. It's written by Charles Wood. And if you look at it, you can see here, here it shows you a map and it covers the moon and then it shows you on the bottom. I don't know if you can read that. Uh, it shows you on the bottom uh, what the lunar, what the Woods Lunar 100 objects are on. So this one's got like about six or eight of them on here. Uh, and you can, it shows you L5 is Copernicus, L17 is Stromoro and, and so on. And so it's, it's really a useful guide uh, for, for learning uh, things about this. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, observing the moon, people tend to, to discount the moon. But the moon will wash away the nebulosity, a lot of faint objects. But in the meantime, you can actually look at the moon. Uh, you might want to get a really good neutral density filter or maybe a red filter so you don't blind yourself. But uh, it, really is, uh, it really is a primary target. People just overlook it so much. That's why it's so good to hear Frank talk about this stuff because it's so easy to just overlook it. In the end, it's the most prominent nearby object uh, <coughs> we can see. So, 
I promise you, I don't have COVID. Anyway, that's about it for me. Eric, All right, thanks, Don. You. Yeah, yeah, we're about we're running about a half hour behind. Any quick questions for Don? As you can see, there's a, a lot of excellent uh, programs available through the Astronomical League or, uh, you know, just getting yourself one, a book that might uh, have good observing targets. There's a lot to see. Uh, I wish our skies were clearer here in Alabama because there's so many things I would love to see and I just don't have enough nights to get out there where I can actually see anything but clouds. Um, Okay, so uh, a bit of housekeeping. 